Hello there, this is the Geeky American Otaku. I'm sorry for the long delay, but the last couple months have been busy here. And of course, I did post a video recently. But now that everything has been taken care of and is somewhat back to normal, I'm going to try and make more videos again. In fact, starting today, I'm going to make a new installment of my new series, The Top Ten. The subject of this edition of the Top 10 is the Top 10 NES games that need to be on Nintendo Switch Online. This is another Nintendo-related video, and this time it's about classic games that need to be added to the Nintendo Switch Online service. And believe it or not, this list was actually giving me some trouble because I was debating with myself whether or not to include games that can be purchased on the Nintendo eShop, but I finally decided, eh, why not? Also, some of these games are my own personal preferences, so not every one of them may be your cup of tea. But in general, I think they'd be pretty well liked and accepted. With that in mind, here's the list. Number 10, Final Fantasy. The first game in a beloved franchise and one of the first RPGs played by many. First released in Japan in 1987 and in the West in 1990, the original Final Fantasy had the player playing as one of the four Warriors of Light, each one possessing a crystal that uses one of the four classical elements, fire, water, earth, or wind. The crystals have been darkened by the four elemental fiends led by the evil Chaos. Together, they must defeat the four fiends, restore the crystals, defeat Chaos, and save their world. The chances of it coming to the Switch, 30%. Final Fantasy is one of the most beloved video game franchises of all time, and although it was first released on a Nintendo system, Square Enix has had a somewhat complicated relationship with Nintendo since the mid-90s, as most of their games have been released on the PlayStation family of systems since then. But Square Enix has released some of their games on Nintendo systems in recent years, with many of the games now being, uh, being available on the Switch, including the Kingdom Hearts series, albeit on cloud. So there may be some hope yet. Number 9, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, Disney had a deal with Capcom to allow the latter to make games based on their properties. And the NES was home to a lot of really great Disney games. One of which was based on the popular TV series, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. In this game, the evil fat cat kidnaps Gadget Hackwrench, the female mouse companion of Chip and Dale, and an idol of furry lovers anywhere. Okay, I'm not gonna go into that territory. Anyway, Chip and Dale have to travel to various maps throughout the city and can walk, jump, duck, and pick up objects, such as, such as acorns, crates, barrels, and balls to throw at enemies as they attempt to reach Fat Cat's casino and rescue Gadget. Their friend, Monterey Jack, will appear to help break down barricades, and Zipper the Fly will give them temporary invincibility. The chances of it coming to the Switch? 40%. Released in 1990, Rescue Rangers was one of the many excellent games based on a Disney cartoon on the NES. It even did well enough to get a sequel. And both games are part of what's called the Disney Afternoon Collection, named after the two-hour daily TV block from the 1990s, which unfortunately for some reason has not been added to the Switch. You'd think it'd be a no-brainer. Hopefully this issue can be rectified soon and some of us old-timers can party again like it's 1990. Number 8, The Goonies 2. Based on the classic 1985 film, this 1987 sequel, which has almost no connection to the movie, has the Fratelli family kidnapping all of the Goonies, except for Mikey Walsh, whom the player controls. Mikey has to rescue his six fellow Goonies while occasionally running into the Fratellis. The game is part platformer and part first person, and is mostly the former as the player moves Mikey to new areas of the map by ladders that, or doors that may act as warps. When Mikey enters a room, the game shifts to the first-person perspective, where the player explores the area by navigating through rooms, searching for hidden items, and interacting with NPCs. In this mode, Mikey will eventually find and rescue his six fellow Goonies, and ultimately rescue Annie the Mermaid, a game-only character who has never seen in any other form of Goonies media. The 
chances of it coming to the Switch? 25%. The game was developed by Konami, who actually produced a game based on the original movie, which was never released outside Japan, and that game was a traditional platformer, whereas the sequel could be considered a Metroidvania type. Of course, The Goonies is owned by Warner Brothers, and it's very likely Konami no longer has the rights to the name. But, if they were able to get the rights to it again, they should consider releasing both games, bringing the, origi the original to our side of the Pacific. Remember, Goonies never say die. Of course, with all the bad stuff going on at Warner Brothers nowadays, mmm, don't get your hopes up. Number 7, Maniac Mansion. Originally made by LucasArts, this graphic adventure game features seven teens led by Dave Miller venturing into the mansion of the Edison family to rescue his girlfriend Sandy. Sandy was kidnapped by mad scientist Fred, who was enslaved by a sentient meteor. The game features 15 action commands such as walk to, unlock, and read. Each character also has unique abilities. For example, Sid and Razor can play musical instruments, while Bernard can repair appliances. The game was originally released on PCs before being ported to the NES, and this required a lot of alterations to meet Nintendo of America's approval. Certain content, such as, in particular, profanity and nudity, had to be removed, but otherwise, the game's essence remained intact. Ironically, you were still able to microwave a hamster. Don't tell PETA. Chances of it coming to the Switch, 30%. Maniac Mansion was released in 1990 for the NES by Jalico, three years after its PC ports. It was praised as a step towards helping video games become a form of storytelling. And it was even one of the first games to feature cutscenes, a term that was invented by the game's co-creator, Ron Gilbert. As we all know, LucasArts was acquired by Disney in 2012, and, all, and they own all versions of the game. And we all know Disney would force Nintendo to shell out some serious cash in order to bring Maniac Mansion to the Switch. Of course, I'm sure fans would love to take another trip into the Edison's Mansion, and Disney would be a bunch of tuna heads not to. Number 6, Double Dragon 3. The last game in the original Double Dragon trilogy on the NES, Double Dragon 3 takes place a year after the fall of the Shadow Warriors, when Marion is kidnapped by a new enemy, and Bimmy and Jimmy, excuse me, Billy and Jimmy Lee, must embark on a new mission to rescue Marion and retrieve the, st the three sacred stones of power, which are being sought by Marion's kidnappers. Their quest will take them across the United States and to China, Japan, and Italy before the final battle in Egypt. The game plays just like the arcade version, where punch and kick are the main button controls, and players can dash by pressing the D-pad twice, although the combat system is closer to the NES titles. However, the game no longer uses the live system that the first two games used, and instead allows two new fighters, Chin and Ronzo, to team up with the Lees. They can be switched out at any time, and each fighter has his own fighting techniques, health points, and speed, making each one ideal for specific situations. And when one fighter is defeated, they will swap with another fighter, unless they are all defeated, upon which the game is over. The chances of it coming to the Switch? 50-50. DD3 was released for the NES in 1991, and it was the last on the NES, and is also known for the mistranslation where Billy was called Bimmy, which was later mocked by the angry video game nerd and even referenced in the 2012 reboot Double Dragon Neon with Bimmy and Jammy, deformed clones of the Lee Brothers. The game can be purchased on the Nintendo eShop, but it should still be available on the NES on NSO, although it would not have all the extra features the eShop version has. But Arc System Works, who currently owns Double Dragon, could allow it to be released on the NES service anyway for players who don't want to pay the extra five bucks, and since the first two games are on there already, you know, for consistency's sake. Number five, DuckTales. One of the most beloved NES games of all time, DuckTales is based on the classic Disney cartoon and features Scrooge McDuck traveling around the world and into space, collecting treasure 
and outwitting his rival, Flintheart Glomgold, to become the world's richest duck. In the game, Scrooge can use his cane to attack enemies, including by swinging it to break open objects, and can even use it like a pogo stick to bounce on enemies from above and jump across gaps. Many beloved characters from the series appear, including Huey, Dewey, Louie, Webby, Launchpad McQuack, Gyro Gearloose, Duckworth, Gizmo Duck, and Bubba the Cave Duck, who all help Scrooge on his quest as he travels to the Amazon, mines in Africa, the Himalayas, Transylvania, and even the moon. Scrooge, of course, will also run into his longtime enemies. In addition to Glom Gold, you'll also have to confront the Beagle Boys and Magicka Dispel. Chances of it coming to the Switch? 40%. DuckTales, like other games in the Disney Afternoon Collection, de they definitely belong on the NES on NSO, or even better, in the Disney Afternoon Collection itself. The game usually ranks in the top 20 of lists of NES games, and it did well enough to earn a sequel, and even got a remaster in 2013, produced by WayForward, the makers of the Shantae series. So it makes perfect sense for DuckTales to be on the Switch. Blathering Blatherskite Disney, you're missing out on a lot of money, and we all know how much the Mouse House likes their money. Number 4, Ninja Gaiden 2 and 3. The second and third games in the original NES trilogy, Ninja Gaiden 2 had Ryu Hayabusa taking up his sword once again against an evil emperor named Ashtar, whom, after the defeat of Jakio in the first game, devises a plan to take over the world and engulf it in darkness, through an evil sword called the Dark Sword of Chaos. In Ninja Gaiden 3, Ryu is framed for the alleged murder of his girlfriend, Irene Liu. He eventually discovers a plan by a CIA agent named Foster and another man named Clancy to utilize an interdimensional rift to create and control a race of energy-infused superhuman mutants. The new games improved on the first by giving Ryu new moves. And in the first, Ryu could attack enemies by thrusting at them with his dragon sword or using secondary weapons like shuriken, which require spiritual strength and can even climb and jump on and off walls and ladders. The second game added the ability for Ryu to use power boosting items while on walls and ladders and to split his body and clone himself, which creates a clone that copies his every move. The third game added the ability for Ryu to hang from pipes and ivy. Chances of it coming to the Switch? 50-50. Ninja Gaiden 2 and 3 were released in 1990 and 1991, respectively, and rounded out one of the NES best trilogies. Two games improved on the graphics and controls of the first one and maintained a high level of difficulty, with one reviewer on IGN calling the second game, quote, a challenging experience the likes of which gamers in the 8-bit era lived and died for. And the third game, though still well received, had later reviews criticizing the plot, level designs, and the game's difficulty level in which the North American version was intentionally made harder than the Japanese version through limited continues, stronger enemies, and omission of a password system. Nonetheless, the games could still be added to the NES on NSO to be paired with the first game. And, with the NSO's rewind and save features, any issues with the difficulty can be lessened. Somewhat. Number 3. Castlevania Trilogy Before Resident Evil, Castlevania was the original horror series. You are Simon Belmont, the descendant of a legendary vampire hunter. In the first game, Simon enters the castle of Count Dracula to destroy him 100 years after his ancestor had vanquished him. Throughout the game, Simon will use his vampire killer whip to attack enemies and bosses, including Frankenstein's monster and the Grim Reaper. In the second game, Simon's Quest, Simon has to find Dracula's body that was split into five parts to undo a curse that Simon had placed on him by Drac. This game actually deviates from the platforming of the first game and incorporates role-playing game and open-world game elements. And of course, the game will cycle between day and night. By day, enemies are weaker and become much stronger at night, although they drop more hearts when defeated during the latter period. The third game, Dracula's Curse, is actually a prequel to the first two, and you play as Simon's ancestor Trevor C. Belmont, 
and it returns to the platforming roots of the first game. Trevor is also joined by three playable allies, Sorceress Saifa Belnade, Pirate Grant Thanasty, and Dracula's son Alucard, a Dompier. The chances of it coming to Switch? 40%. More than a decade before Resident Evil, Castlevania was the series to play for horror fans. All three games are among the most beloved NES titles of all time. The second one, though, has seen some retroactive criticism, mostly due to its backtracking, easy bosses, and the day-to-night cycle, as well as the poor English localization. The game was infamous for its cover on the second issue of Nintendo Power, and was also used as the first video game review by James Rolfe, the angry video game nerd. The third game, however, is considered the best of the three by many, and it even served as the basis for the popular animated Castlevania Netflix series. While the NES trilogy can be bought on the eShop as part of the Castlevania Anniversary Collection, it would make sense for Konami to have it available on the NES on NSO as well. Number 2. Contra. Another great game by Konami. Contra has you playing as Marine Commandos Bill Riser and Lance Bean, who are sent to the Amazon to destroy aliens known as Red Falcon before they can conquer Earth. The game contains a mix of side-scrolling and 3D view levels, and Bill and Lance will use weapons such as rifles, machine guns, laser guns, flamethrowers, and something called a spread gun. Bill and Lance travel through eight different stages, including a jungle, waterfall, snowfield, military bases, and ultimately the alien's lair, while along the way battling bosses like the Gromades, Gul'doth, and Emperor Demon Dragon Java, and the Gomoramos King. Chances of it coming to the Switch, 40%. Contra is one of the first shooters many gamers have played, with one reviewer co calling it, quote, the standard by which future platform shooters would be judged. It's also known for being quite difficult and testing your reaction skills with IGN voting it number one as the toughest game to beat. In fact, the game is now famous for creating awareness of the now famous Konami code. Say it with me! Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start! This is where the player would get an extra 30 lives, which most players probably burn through playing the game. Again, it's available on the eShop in a collection like Castlevania, but Konami should allow it on the NES on NSO as well. And number one, Mega Man, numbers one through six. How could we forget about everyone's favorite little blue bomber? Celebrating his 35th anniversary, Mega Man first hit the NES way back in 1987, and it was Capcom's first game on a console, starting his battle with Dr. Wily and his robot masters. The original Mega Man, known as Rockman in Japan, was well received, but it didn't sell as well as they hoped. Probably because of that crazy ass looking American box art, and of course, its extreme difficulty. Nonetheless, Capcom would release a sequel two years later which added new features such as improved audio, visuals, energy tanks, a password save system, and thankfully an easier difficulty option. The second game was a huge improvement over its predecessor and went on to become the most successful title in the series and is among the best NES games of all time. Eventually, a total of six Mega Man games would be released on the NES, with the last one being released in 1994 at the end of the NES's life cycle. Chances of it coming to Switch? 35%. The Mega Man series is one of the most beloved of all time, and it is still going strong today. They even had an 11th entry in the mainline series not too long ago. And although a lot of fans would love to see the Blue Bomber on the NES on NSO, it might not happen, simply because Capcom has released all the games and compilations, both physically and on the eShop, known as the Mega Man Legacy Collection. So it's obvious Capcom wants players to spend money instead even though we're already paying for the NES on NSO. Of course, Capcom can be nice and just allow it on the NES on NSO anyway. But I am still hoping that they will revive development on Mega Man Legends 3. So we'll all have to wait and see. And that is my list of the top 10 NES games that need to be brought to the Nintendo Switch Online. If you guys can think of any other games you'd like to see Nintendo bring to the Switch, let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I am the Geeky American Otaku, and I'll see you out there in the Splatlands.
deep hurting.